Hello everyone, welcome to the last lecture of this class. I think uh, if my counting is correct, then uh, that makes this lecture number 13. So I'm going to talk about sort of the last reduced basis method in our list. And I've kind of left this towards the end on purpose, partly because it's uh, a little bit more complex, more advanced, but also because it kind of falls within a different framework. And to address that, I have the slide that we have seen many times before. The slide where I'm emphasizing this decomposition into an online and an offline stage. Where during our offline stage we have tons of computational power, uh, we can explore solution manifolds, create our reduced basis method, and then during the online phase we make use of those. Uh, and the, the whole objective of all the reduced basis methods that we've talked about is to have that split uh, cleanly. So we want to make sure that nothing in our online phase is dependent on the high fidelity approximation spaces that are important in the offline phase. And if there's really one thing that I would like to you to take away from this class is well that this is to an extremely large extent what uh, model reduction is about in the context that we've talked about this. And this is so important that I'll actually ask pretty much every one of you during your presentation about this slide and how it relates to your individual project. And I have sort of an idea of what kind of answer I expect, so I encourage you to think about this already. Because also during your individual projects, this should be important. Because this is what uh, the reduced basis methods that we've talked about are about. Nevertheless, uh, PGD, proper generalized decomposition, is trying to do this a little differently. So PGD is trying to throw away the offline phase. And it is trying to create the reduced basis on the fly. And obviously the, uh, the charm of that is, is very clear, right? Right now it seems like the offline phase is sort of the, the thing that's holding our, us back in, in terms of making this a useful, useful approach. So it's clear that that might actually be something that could be very powerful. Now, of course, nothing is free, so we're going to have to pay uh, a little bit for that, and that's going to be in terms of uh, possible applications and um, in terms of, of um, robustness, I would say. Then, um, let me see. I will probably jump straight to my notes. Yes. So proper generalized decomposition. So the, the thing that proper generalized decomposition is all about is trying to write our solution that we're looking for, which we're going to assume is going to depend on a, a series of variables. So uh, for now I will leave this relatively unspecified and I'm calling Xi and Zeta and we'll see in a second what those could be. But the objective that we have or the assumption that we make um, for PGD is that this can be written as a sum, potentially infinite sum, of functions that are dependent on the first variable and functions that are dependent on the second variable. So in PGD, the core is a separation of variables. And we've seen this actually a couple of times, and I'll, I'll get back to where we've seen this for instance. Uh, uh, but for now, I would already like to address this is what we did for uh, the model decomposition as well, right? So we had uh, xi as a spatial variable and zeta as a time variable. And then we could find these optimal modes or these, these useful modes uh, from eigenvalue problems. So we're trying to sort of do the same thing, but PGD is trying to do this also for problems that do not have this naturally. So it's trying to sort of force this. And the whole the reduced basis approach here uh, falls on the assumption that, um, that a low rank approximation 
suffices suffices to properly to properly describe you so we can say you is approximately a reduced basis approximation to that where we would write a, a reduced basis approximation as this finite sum of these modes And this looks a lot like what we've done for model decomposition, but we're also only taking a finite number of these modes. But model decomposition is really not the only place where we've seen this. Uh, in a sense, this is also pretty much exactly what POD itself does. In order to understand that, we have to think a little bit more about POD and specifically address one of the things that we've kind of looked over until now. So this was my slide on single value decomposition, right? This is what we uh, do after we have a snapshot matrix uh, to obtain the most important modes. And the way that worked was we had in blue here our snapshot matrix and the single value de decomposition then decomposed that into uh, an, or, uh, an ortho uh, orthonormal matrix multiplied by a diagonal matrix multiplied by another orthonormal matrix. And in general we've looked most at this lower part uh, where uh, we would have our spatial degrees of freedom here, right? So those are our u vectors, u vector of coefficients, and here we would have different choices of parameter. Right? We would sample our parameter space, and each parameter point would fit in a new uh, column of, of our snapshot matrix. And then we would have a decomposition as such, where we called these vectors xi vectors. And we had our singular values along the diagonal of the central matrix. And then we had this zeta vectors. And then there should be a transpose if I want to write it like this. And we've almost exclusively focused on the xi vectors. Those were the most important modes. And we could say that because we knew that the snapshot matrix, if we work out the way that this matrix multiplication works, that, that would be equal to um, the sum over, well, n of these guys, where n will be the size of the largest, uh, largest, uh, the width of each one, any one of these matrices, of each of these spatial modes, multiplied by each of the, the, the right singular vectors, that's what those were called, multiplied by whatever was on the diagonal here, those are the singular values sigma. And if we then ordered sigma to be such that the largest sigma would be on the top left and uh, the smallest sigma would be in the bottom right, then we, we could prove that the best representation of our entire snapshot in the Frobenius norm uh, was a truncated uh, sum of this series. Now that's pretty much exactly what we're trying to do in PGD as well, right? We're trying to write now a function of two variables as this decomposed form of functions of the one variable multiplied by functions of the second variable and we're trying to do that in such a way uh, that we have a very very good approximation of the complete function in the complete two variables when we only take a truncated uh, series into account. So that is pretty much exactly what this is with the one difference that our, our, our number of columns would not be an arbitrary sampling of parameter points, but would be a sampling in that second parameter. Yeah? So this would be, uh, and now I'm, I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot with my change of variable names. So this is going to be our second variable. And if we do that, if we have on our rows our spatial variable and on our columns are second variable or maybe on the rows are x variable and on the columns are y variable uh, then the first the left singular vectors are still going to be the most important modes for our row uh, variables right the x variables uh, but the right singular vectors the ones that we've sort of avoided talking about so far are going to be the most important modes for the second variable whether that's y or maybe still our parameter 
And this is something that we've actually already sort of seen in the example that I proposed when I was talking about this the first time. Suppose that our snapshot matrix is a picture where we have information in each row and information in each column. And then we do a singular value decomposition or, or POD on that. Uh, then we will see that the first mode, that multiplication, that cross product multiplication, uh, would look like that. But we have a mode in well, X, that you can, where you can see this is a, a standard shape in X that remains constant through all Y's. But this Y or not remains constant, but the same shape, and then multiplied by uh, a certain mode in the Y direction. Yeah? So here we have. So here we have our right single vectors, and here we have our left single vectors. Where one and the two would still have to be multiplied by sigma to make this consistent. And what we saw back then as well is that once we start to add a couple of these modes, then we actually get a very good approximation uh, to, to the picture that we're trying to describe. Okay, so that is sort of the idea, and this is an idea that we should be relatively familiar with because, well, first of all, we saw the model decomposition, and even for problems that do not fit in the model decomposition assumption, um, maybe we are talking about nonlinear problems, uh, parameter dependent problems, uh, or problems that actually from a uh, PDE perspective do not satisfy a separation of variables uh, uh, per se, we can still force a separation of variables on them in a POD sense and just sample the most important modes. And that's what PGD is about, with the one addition that in PGD we're trying to do this on the fly. Yeah? So we're on the fly. We're adding new couples of functions g, i, or if I say the sum is until n, then I could say here g, n plus 1 of xi and a function w, n plus 1 of zeta. So as we're progressing in our simulation and we're figuring out that we do not have the, the, the accuracy level that we might want, we could add these new couples. So we would do this when the approximation becomes inaccurate. Now it sounds like a, a very nice strategy, but there's actually two issues with this. One might be a bit more obvious than the other. Um, the first one that I would address, there's going to be two catches. The first one is that in some sense there has to be the capability of writing a separation of variables. And we can only write something in terms of a separation of variables if our variables satisfy sort of a, a tensorial structure. And I'll write it down and then I'll talk about what I mean by that. So we require a tensorial structure in Xi and Zeta. So what that means is that for if my if my psi variable is allowed to, to range from a to b from, from 0 to 1, then at each point in psi I'm also allowed to have zeta to vary from c to d. And those values a and b and c and d uh, should be constant and should not change with respect to the coordinate of the other guy. Right? So for instance, a square satisfies that. Yeah? So if we would model a square in x and y, where x and y would be my psi and zeta right now, then this satisfies a tensorial structure. Yeah? This x ranges from x0 to x1, and for every single x, 
uh, also y ranges from y0 to y1. Yeah, and that's true for x0 and true for x1. So we can write our complete domain omega as uh, x0 to x1, that's a range in x, tensor product or cross product, um, y0, y1. So those are the kind of domains that we're interested in. Now that might already look extremely limited, right? That we're only interested in squares. Okay, let's talk about another example that might be slightly less obvious. Let's talk about a circle. Well, clearly if I describe my circle in x and y, <coughs> then this is not going to satisfy this tensorial nature. Sometimes, I still do not understand what's going on. So this guy was alright. But this guy is not. Right, because my x is allowed to vary around here, maybe from, from minus r until r. But my y is allowed, in the center is allowed to vary from minus r until r. But towards x is half r, it's only allowed to vary a different range. Right? So we, we can't write the domain omega in a way that we multiply a range in x by a range in y. Still, we can do this if we make use of a coordinate transformation. So if we describe our circle in polar coordinates, where one of our variables would be r and the second variable would be theta. And because then our domain again can be described as 0 to r and from 0 to 2 pi in a tensorial structure. Where this is our range in, in r variable and this is our range in our theta variable. And also that also satisfies the strange stru uh, tensorial structure. And in that sense, pretty much every, every problem that might be interested in, if you can find a mapping back to a, 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 a block, uh, a square in 2D, a block in 3D, then we could use something like this. Now, are those the only examples? No. Uh, actually, we can also make use of very strange looking shapes if that is not the separation that we're interested in. And suppose that that is our, our spatial domain, but suppose that our, our second variable is not, a, is not a y or another spatial variable. Our first variable is a spatial variable and our second variable could be a parameter. Yeah, so we've talked about partial uh, uh, differential equations that are parameter dependent all the time. And so that would be another, another case where we might be interested in a, a certain range of mu that we call our parameter space and for each point in space which would be our xi variable here so x would be the, the complete vector x would be xi and we have a range of parameters mu from in also in a box like that yeah so uh, xi would be x and our second variable would be this mu yeah, and then still, the, if we're trying to find the solution for our complete space parameter partial differential equation, uh, that would still lie in a, in a tensor uh, space, a space that multiplies our domain omega by our domain p. Yeah, so the complete domain is omega cross p, again a tensor structure. Now that's another example, and now I actually come to the most important example, and maybe also the most obvious example, but still I wanted to keep this one for last. And this is going to be the, the case that we're going to talk about for pretty much the rest of this lecture. That is the case where again our space is, is allowed to have an arbitrary shape, and that's going to represent this first variable in our separation, and the second variable in our separation is going to be time. So this would be t0 until capital T, where our parameter is, is the time uh, coordinate. And we call this domain from t0 to t, that's what I'll call 
this t. So that our, our complete domain is omega cross t. Now to some of you that might seem rather obvious, treating time just as another variable with this tensor product nature of our new space-time domain. Uh, to others that might seem uh, a bit uh, confusing. We could really simply think of time just as another coordinate, just as we would think of uh, any spatial coordinate as an additional coordinate. Right? So we can also again treat a space-time function where we have a variable in space and a variable in time, so this would be x and this would be t. So this is a function f of x and t. And we could also treat this in our POD framework, just like we've done before, where we might sample over a whole bunch of, of points in space and time. We would create we would create a snapshot matrix, we would do POD, and once we've done POD at that stage, uh, here are then our, our spatial um, the results from our spatial sampling, and here are the results for each of our time samples. Then our, our first matrix would uh, involve the modes in, in space, and our uh, right single vectors would be the modes in time. And that's what this is shown. Yeah? So this is after one spatial mode, and one temporal mode, and this is after two spatial modes, and one temporal mode, and this is after three uh, spatial modes and three temporal modes. And you can see that uh, the error reduces quite fast. And that's what we're familiar with with POD, right? POD is in principle the best approximation, but clearly with the flaw that we need to know the function in advance, right? And that is precisely the second catch. Uh, that is precisely what we do not want to do with PGD. We want to do everything during an online stage where we do not want to waste the computational research, uh, resources in exploring what our functions might potentially be to build a snapshot matrix, to build a reduced basis method, and we want to do this as we're progressing. So the second catch, right, so there were two catches, the first one we need the tensorial structure, the second catch is we do not know The solution that we're actually interested in, the solution that we're actually trying to compute beforehand. And that is quite obvious, because if we knew that beforehand, then we wouldn't have to do any of this. But also, clearly, that's rather problematic. Yeah, we're trying to add modes that are very good at representing you without knowing you. Yeah, that's clearly the big challenge in, in what we're trying to do right now. So what do we know of you? Well, we're talking about partial differential equations. Yeah, so we have an initial boundary value problem. Right, right now I'm going to talk, focus on, on PDEs in space and time. So what we have is we have a description of you in terms. So we have a description of you in terms of um, initial boundary value problem. So let's go to our canonical example, uh, the heat equation, where we would have that the time derivative of u minus some heat coefficient times the Laplacian of u is equal to some forcing function f we have our Dirichlet boundary conditions, and we'll assume that those are all across the boundary. So we have u is equal to u d. And we have an initial condition, so u is equal to u0, where, right now, the domains that we're interested in is that the PDE is satisfied in our space-time domain. Our Dirichlet condition is satisfied on the boundary of the spatial domain, but for every single time, so there's still this tensorial structure. And our initial condition is satisfied on the entire domain, but only for our t0 time. Yeah? So to kind of illustrate what this tensorial structure right now looks like, suppose that we have this potato shade omega, 
Yeah, and then the boundary of this guy is, is, is partial omega. And this is a tensorial structure. So for every omega, we have another, uh, another coordinate, the time coordinate, that is also allowed to vary from t0 to t. And that is true for every single point in our spatial domain, such that we also get sort of this slabby nature of the thing. Yeah? So for every point, we have a distensorial structure, such that for every point in space, we can also go from t0 to t. So then, this u is equal to ud on partial omega cross t, means that in the space-time domain, uh, we're satisfying this boundary condition on this entire, pretty much the rim of our, our space-time column. Yeah? And the initial condition is satisfied on the complete spatial domain at the time coordinate t0. Now we can uh, pretty much treat these partial differential equations in the same way that we are familiar with. So normally what we actually do is we, we try to separate out the time derivative, right? That's what we do with a, a finite difference type of approach. And we're still using uh, our finite element method for the spatial problem. But we don't have to do this. Um, this is uh, mathematically completely sound if we set this whole thing in a weak statement in space and in time. And that is what space-time finite element methods are about, and in a sense that is precisely also what PhD is about. Right? We're looking for modes in space and in time. So we're trying to now develop a weak formulation for this partial differential equation. And just to be clear, um, so far we've talked a lot about per uh, parameterized partial differential equations. In a very strong analogy, we could also think about the time variable now as this additional parameter in the same sense that mu was our parameter before. So, we're trying to develop a space-time weak formulation. Now, we're just going to proceed just as usual. We're multiplying by a test function and integrating over now our space-time domain. So, it's u t times the test function v plus, and then we do integration of parts. And we have a gradient, but of course, just to be clear, it's just a spatial gradient, right? And that's going to be equal to fv. And the boundary conditions, the, the boundary integrals, they all drop out because we have this strong imposition of our Dirichlet condition. And well, we're looking for these functions in certain function spaces, uh, these Sobolev spaces. Now this gets a little tricky, so I'll try to avoid talking about it too much. So I'll just say with uh, u and v in suitable function spaces function spaces but suitable in this case also means that uh, for instance the space for u satisfies both the initial condition and, and the boundary conditions yeah, so that for sure every function that we are looking for uh, satisfies that by, by, by definition of the space the function space. <clears throat> so this whole statement is really nothing more than what we have seen many times before, some bilinear form that involves u and v being equal to some linear form that involves v. Right? And when we write it like that, we don't care about what our coordinates are and what our variables are, what our, our differential operators are. This is just a bilinear form equaling a linear form and we're looking for the solution u such that that is the case for all possible solutions v, for all possible test functions v. Yeah? So we're sort of hiding the fact that the integrals are on our space-time domain. But other than that, this is something that we're completely familiar with. So this is how our solution is encoded, right? So the, the second big problem was that we do not know what our solution is, so that we cannot do a POD type of approach. We want to do this as we're progressing in our simulation. Um, so we do not know what U is, but we have this information. This has to somehow be satisfied for the real function, the real solution, uh, U. That is the way that U is encoded for us. And now 
our objective is to approximate u, which is dependent on our space variable and dependent on a time variable, to approximate this in a, a reduced basis sense. So I still use the tilde, even though things are starting to get a little bit messy in terms of what the basis represents right now. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll stick with the notation that a tilde represents a reduced basis solution. As, well again also, which depends on space and on time, as this finite sum of well, as few as possible modes n of functions phi, which depend on, on space, and functions lambda that depend on time. Now the way, in the end, we still want to compute, okay, so our objective right now, that's how I should say this, our objective right now is to incrementally add functions phi and lambda. But phi and lambda are coupled, right? So we're looking for couples phi and lambda to improve our estimate of u in the sense that it, it becomes better and better at satisfying this bilinear form is equal to a linear form relationship. That means that in the end, what we really want to compute is these phi's and these lambdas. In order to do that, we're going to discretize their spaces. Yeah? So, just to, to emphasize that a little bit, I'll write down these are h's. These are numerical approximations in the sense that uh, our function phi, which depends on space, lies in a finite dimensional function space. So, again, looking at our potato shaped domain, we would actually generally create a grid for that uh, space, just like we would typically do for finite element methods. We would define maybe hat functions on that, just to, all still the same, and we define a finite element approximation space uh, in which we're looking for phi of h. And we would do pretty much exactly the same for our lambdas. So lambda of h, every one of these guys is going to live in a finite dimensional space lambda, which would, well, what, what did our, our, our time domain look like? Well, it was simply a line, right, going from t is equal to zero to, to, our, to our final time. So we'd also discretize our time domain, uh, for which we could also, again, simply use these hat functions. Right? So nothing special. So this by itself, by the way, is actually a pretty big research topic in general, and it's called space-time finite time methods. Uh, there's still quite a bit of... Uh, of research going on there. Um, it has a, a couple of nice promises in the sense that um, doing something like that is mathematically more rigorous. Uh, we, can, we can understand better what's going on if we're also treating our time derivative in terms of uh, um, sublet spaces, finite element approximation, uh, versus when we're doing something completely different for our time domain, uh, namely a finite difference strategy. Okay. So let's take a look at um, the expenses that we're talking about here, and let's focus on so trying to solve this equation. So if we would use an actual space-time finite element method to solve something like this, where we're using a mesh, like the potato-shaped mesh, uh, for our uh, for our spatial uh, dimension and or our spatial functions and uh, the, the the separated time line for our time derivatives, or our, our, our temporal variable, um, then the computational expense that we were talking about, well, that depends on the dimensionality of this space, right? so normally, if, if we call the dimension of VH, if we call that N, right, that's what we typically do, and the dimension of our lambda h is equal to n t, then if we were to solve if we were to solve this bilinear form equaling a linear form in a space-time finite element setting would involve n times and t degrees of freedom. And that's obviously a lot, right? If we have 10,000 degrees of freedom 
for our space dimension, which is really not that much. And we would have a thousand different time steps, so a thousand different uh, degrees of freedom in our time space, um, or a time variation. Then we would end up with uh, 10 million degrees of freedom just like that. So that is honestly also not really what we're doing in space-time fine-time methods. In the space-time fine-time methods we do treat the time uh, with a discontinuous Galerkin method is what that, that is called. Pretty much that, what that comes down to is that every element is completely decoupled from the next element. So in every um, time increment we're only really solving uh, the, the system for the space um, the, the spatial problem. But still in a finite time of context using a DG approach for the time derivative. Um, or using DG, sorry, or discontinuous uh, basis in time, we would have, or, or if using, we would have um, nt times n degree of freedom systems. Yeah, so we would solve an n degree of freedom system nt times. And that looks much more like our classical uh, finite difference strategy, but also in each time step you would have to solve the spatial uh, problem with n degrees of freedom. So that would be nt times an n degree of freedom system. So we're trying to do this differently, right? We're talking about model reduction. So a PGD strategy now aims to iteratively add modes add modes functions phi h in our finance spatial space and modes lambda in our finite element uh, time discretization space so it's that we require roughly um, to require roughly uh, n plus n t yeah? for each, each iteration we're solving one spatial problem and one temporal problem by itself and then multiplied by the number of modes that we're adding so that would be n, right? If we haven't until in the end n of these of these guys to approximate our function. Yeah, so that that is a big uh, a big jump going from uh, maybe a thousand times solving a ten thousand degree of freedom versus now maybe five times adding a, a ten thousand degree of freedom system. Yeah, but this can be really be orders of magnitude difference. Okay, so how do we actually go about doing this, right? Um, the first thing we're going to do is, or at least in my notation, the first thing we'll do is we'll go with an initial guess of our first mode. And this is, might actually still be a relatively obvious guess. So we're going to start. So we're going to start with the first choice, and now we're adding an iterator. So this is going to be our first approximation to our utility. Which is a function of space and of time as the initial condition u0, which is just a function of space, times well, 1. So this would be our first spatial mode, phi of x. And this, well, it's just a constant function, but in the, in the notation of before, this would be our first temporal mode, lambda. So this is going to be lambda 1 of t. And clearly it's independent of t, but uh, that's still the structure that we're adhering to. Now clearly if we choose this to be our, our first approximation to our true, uh, true solution u, uh, then we automatically satisfy our initial condition, right? Because at t is equal to 0, we obtain u tilde is equal to u0, and that's exactly the condition. And we're also uh, satisfying our boundary conditions. And I'm making here the assumption that the boundary conditions remain uh, constant in space, we could do this differently, uh, we'd have to change some certain things, but I'd like to keep, stick with the easy case in this case, uh, where uh, our initial condition also satisfies the digital boundary, but then at time zero, 
and that's going to st stay the same for all times, meaning that we have uh, with our initial condition, we're also satisfying all duty step boundary conditions. So we already have an approximation which satisfies the initial condition, naturally, and the boundary conditions. But clearly it doesn't satisfy the PDA. And what do I mean by that? So it does satisfy the second and the third condition here, but it does not satisfy our original um, yeah, partial differential equation, this guy. And we can actually measure this in a sense, because this is telling us that we have a large residual. Now remember, what was the residual? That is uh, for some arbitrary function, if I, were to, if I were to substitute that in the left hand derivative side, and I would evaluate whatever the result of that guy would be, um, and I would subtract what it should be, f, then that's the residual. So that's not the error directly, but it does show that it's not solving the partial differential equation. Yeah, so if I were to substitute u0 for, for, for this ut, well, this is going to be 0, the time derivative of our u0 is 0. Uh, still, we might have some second derivatives in there, but those would not be equal to the, the applied force. So we have a residual, and we know this is not yet our final approximation to, to our function u. At least it's not satisfying um, what we, we wanted to satisfy. And that's where the iterative strategy comes in. So next, or now, now we wish to add new modes, so phi 2 of x and lambda 2 of t so these guys should be sub superscripts yeah. to improve To improve the approximation u in the sense of well, the only thing that we know about u, namely that it has to satisfy this relation, right? This bilinear form relation. So we add new modes to improve that the bilinear form of u tilde 1 plus our new contribution phi 2 of x lambda 2 of t, which is weighted or tested against all possible test functions, that that is satisfied better. Well, we can't really satisfy this in one go. If we could, then that means that our, our solution would be perfectly separable, which might be true, but that's generally not the case, right? So generally, we do not have functions u that satisfy this relation that can actually be written as the sum of two space time modes. But nevertheless, we might want to improve upon our, sol our solution utility by adding a space mode and a time mode such that this is somehow satisfied maybe for more choices of v. So not for all choices of v. If it were to be satisfied for all choices of v, uh, then it would, uh, it would be the exact solution. But it might be satisfied for more choices of test functions. And so what we want is that this is true for all functions v in uh, v, h, and then somehow I'm actually not sure what symbol to, to use here. I think it should be a. Uh, that's not my correct. Something like this, lambda h. So not for all test functions v that lies in this in this compiled space of space and time, <coughs> but for a couple more. So, probably, to write, to write down what I just said, probably we can't find phi 2, lambda 2, to satisfy this directly. But instead, 
we add a good phi to a over a good phi to and lambda two. And a good lambda 2 and phi 2, in this case, is going to mean uh, that uh, the following relationship holds. So if we have our new solution, where we've now added our spatial and temporal mode to our previous approximation, and if we weight this now for our choice of test function to also be equal to those two functions, or these this, this space-time modes, then this relationship is satisfied. So making sure that at least for the modes that we are adding ourselves, also if we test against those modes, then we're still satisfying the bilinear equal linear uh, form relationship. And this is called the lurking of Fogonality. So this is somehow uh, some modes phi and lambda that we would like to add to our, our reduced order model. Now this is also a highly nonlinear problem. Uh, we're actually, recall, we're looking for these functions, right? But now we have a square relation over here. We actually, if we interpret both of these as unknowns, this would even be a, a fourth order nonlinearity. And also on the right hand side, the right hand side is not really the right hand side because this also depends on on, the, on the, the thing that we're trying to compute in a, in a square sense. So it's still a pretty tricky problem to solve, um, but we can sort of separate this into two problems. So this is a highly nonlinear problem. I'm going to separate it into two semi-linear problems. We're going to separate it into one problem that gets us a mode phi from a given mode lambda and we do that by solving the following linear system of equations. Okay, so here we're assuming that we have a given temporal mode, a lambda, which means that this guy is, is given, this is given, and this is given. Now we're trying to compute a new phi, that's this guy, such that this relation holds for all phi stars in our, in our finite element space, in space. So for, those, for that, the one that we obtain then, this, this result is, is, is clearly satisfied because this has to be true for all possible functions phi in that space, so also for our, our choice directly. Yeah? So finding a phi from a lambda that satisfies this relation will automatically also satisfy this relation. And I have another problem that's pretty much the inverse that gives me, so get a lambda from a given phi, and that's pretty much the opposite statement here. So these are two linear relationships that each require a, a previous assumption for a lambda or a phi. So the way that we would typically solve this is to first pick a re relatively random choice lambda. So that is our function in time, the mode in time. So I'm saying relatively random, but we sort of know, typically we know what's happening in time. Maybe we have sort of an oscillatory uh, load, or we have a decaying load. So then you might choose a lambda that sort of behaves in, in the same sense. 
So we can sort of pick this uh, based on the known load diagram. And so typically we would assume that if our load shows uh, certain characteristics in time, then we might also expect our modal decomposition of sorts uh, to, to behave relatively similarly. From that choice, we're going to determine a corresponding mode phi. With that choice of phi, we're going to update our choice of lambda. With that choice of lambda, we're going to update phi. And this is what we would have to iterate a couple of times. And in a PGD strategy, this typically converges in two or three iterations. Now, after we've done that, we have obtained a new mode phi multiplied by mode lambda. So we have obtained then we have u tilde 2, which is equal to well, the sum of our original u tilde, which was u0 plus phi 2 of x lambda 2 of t. And now with this new approximation, we can again check to see if the residual is small, if the residual is not small, we would uh, try and add another mode to this. Yeah, so, uh, and we check if the residual is small. If not, add a new mode. And we're going to do this until we are happy with our approximation of the true solution, with our reduced order approximation being the sum of n of these guys, phi i of x and lambda i of t. And then to kind of come back uh, as a last thing, to come back to the amount of computational expense for something like this. Why did I write about that? Probably a bit lower. Mm. Yeah, here. So we're talking about the computational expense here. Then I was saying it will be uh, of the order of n plus mt times small n. And based on the number of iterations, then we can actually see that this requires uh, roughly uh, three, three iterations times n times n t plus n types of computations. Yeah, so again, that would be still considerably smaller than having to do a thousand different time steps. Okay, so this is the core concept of PGD. And that was kind of the last mode order reduction technique that I wanted to talk about. Um, it's starting to get a little bit more complex and I'm being a little bit more vague in my explanation. And that is because I don't think it's uh, too important that you understand uh, all the details here. I want to give you a bit of a flavor of uh, how complex these things can get, what we can achieve with them, and that there's still a uh, sufficient uh, amount of research involved here. And to also illustrate that, I still have a couple of slides in which I'll kind of focus on uh, some of the PhD work that uh, one of our, our uh, most recent um, PhD finalists uh, worked on. Um, to actually to first show the final results of something like that we just talked about, uh, this will be uh, an example of this strategy, the PGD strategy for exactly a uh, heat equation in time. So we have a certain influx, we have certain boundary conditions, and I think these are symmetry conditions, and then these would be the modes that you would incrementally add, right? So these are the spatial modes, and this would be a time mode. And, okay, yeah, then coming to the PhD research, uh, I also kind of showed this in my introductory uh, lecture, 
quite a while back now. Uh, so I want to kind of connect back to that sort of uh, as a closing statement of this class. Uh, and this work was on fatigue damage computation. And what that is about is uh, rather complex solar mechanics computations, right? We have nonlinear relationships in terms of uh, all kinds of state variables, damage, plasticity, etc. Energy release rates, whatever. Um, we have to compute over an extremely long amount of time, right? Fatigue takes a long time. And we have to take into account many different load cycles. Yeah? So we have a long time, but also the small time effect is precisely what is causing the damage. It's the cycle going up and down. So we have to compute many, many, many different cycles using a relatively complex uh, model. Right? So how would we go about doing something like that? And that's exactly the type of approaches that model reduction are, are intended for. And we find in this case that particularly P, uh, PGD uh, proved very useful. Um, so the general idea from a lower perspective here is that well, we're, we're trying to recompute a new cycle over and over and over again and probably the result is, is going to change obviously but it's going to change minutely. Uh, so our solution space is relatively compact. Yeah? That's the first thing we think about and after that we can say so okay maybe a model reduction technique could be useful. Right? We're not going to throw a model reduction at everything. We first have to think about um, can we pro possibly achieve something uh, using model reduction strategies? And given the assumed compactness of our solution space, this could prove to be very effective. So that's kind of what's showing here on the, the bottom right. So still from my introductory slide. Yeah, so the solutions lie close to a low dimensional subspace. Now fatigue is of course interesting now or important for all kinds of structures. Pretty much every structure that has a uh, long operation uh, duration and most importantly structures that also um, have then this, this varying load uh, such that you have uh, uh, load, so load frequency and load amplitude and typically what we do is uh, we get these SN diagrams where you have uh, the amount of uh, the, uh, the load amplitude and the, the frequency uh, versus or the peak loads in that sense uh, versus how many uh, of these cycles we're going through and we find that um, if we're operating under certain uh, tolerance levels and uh, then pretty much no fatigue occurs and other than that we can get a very vague estimate of how many cycles we'd have to go through before fatigue occurs but that's still extremely empirical so for something like that we might actually be interested in trying to approach this with a numerical computational model so on the left here you see a couple of uh, example applications so um, the approach of this PhD student uh, was to use the Latin method in conjunction with the PGD approach. And that's something that happens quite often. So the first thing I should I have to talk about here to illustrate the work that he did is, is the Latin approach. Um, and the Latin approach is an alternative strategy for computing a complete load path of a given structure that is sort of different from our classical approach of doing increments. Yeah, so here we're doing load increments and in load increments, so we're increasing our load a little bit, we have to do these Newton uh, iterations, these newton refson uh, iterations. And that's how we pretty much do all our nonlinear finite element analysis. And that's also kind of what I talked about in my lecture on nonlinear finite elements. Now we're increasing the load. For that load we're doing uh, iterations to get a, a steady state solution or our uh, um, the, 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 the zero residual solution, the solution that satisfies our nonlinear conservative laws, uh, but also our equilibrium relations uh, and our kinematic relations. So that seems relatively straightforward and obvious, right? We tend to think of time not as uh, an additional variable, but rather something that we have to march forward in. But now that we've thought about time as yet another variable in a model reduction framework, where we have the complete function and time already set in our modes, then we might actually think about doing something like this a little differently, and that's what Latin does. So Latin, rather than going from load increments and iterating each increment and then proceeding, what Latin does is we're going to get a first estimate of a complete load path. Then we find, well, this complete load path actually doesn't satisfy our conservative relations everywhere, so we're going to update our conservative relations, and then we find Wait a second, now with these new uh, satisfied conservative relations, it actually doesn't satisfy equilibrium equations anymore, so we're going to satisfy those as well, and then 
also the kinematic relations. And in this way, we're sort of iterating towards a load path that is satisfying all our equations in, in one go. Yeah. So the increments, the increment, uh, incrementational nature or the iterative nature, I should really say, uh, lies in a complete computation of a load path. So actually, the name large time increment this is kind of false. Uh, this is no longer talking about increments in the same sense as, as, as here. So this is also kind of addressed in a couple of papers on Latin methods that the name is rather uh, confusing because it seems to be contradicting its own main statement. To not use increments, but rather compute the whole thing in one go and iterate. But then it would be large time iterations and Latit maybe didn't sound quite so nice. Okay, uh, so that's the, 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 the base idea of the, the Latin strategy. Um, and yeah, let me first say one more thing before I continue. So these iterations, they are, as I'll show in, in just a second, they kind of involve a local and a global step. And I want to emphasize those already in the graph in the bottom here. Uh, so our local step would be to, to update constitutive relations here. So to make sure that those are satisfied. Why is that local? Because constitutive relations in finite element frameworks, they pretty much act on the Gauss point level. Yeah, at each inter integration point, we're gonna make sure that uh, our stiffness, uh, st stress strain relation, maybe with plasticity, maybe with damage, maybe with hardening, that that is satisfied. So that happens on a an uh, integration point level without looking at neighboring behavior. Yeah? So that is a local uh, statement. And the other statements are more global statements. And maybe even maybe even this guy as well. These are global statements. Yeah? So this is something where we have to look at the, the structure as a whole. Uh, to make sure that it satisfies the, the stresses, satisfy the equilibrium relations and the normal dynamic conditions, and that the displacement satisfies certain kinematic relationships. So this is also how the, the iterative strategy is going to function. And here again, the, so the, the split in local and global could be looked at as, as here, this being the local step, and this being the global step. Now we're in the in local step, we're updating our state equations, and maybe we're also doing a certain evolution of our state equations, right? We might evolve the damage um, or the plasticity uh, or the hardening uh, parameters in our constitutive laws. And then our constitutive laws also tell us how the stresses and strains relate. Um, and in the global uh, step, we we'll make sure that our complete structure satisfies uh, static and kinematic admissibility. So then the algorithm, and again, my objective here is not to, to give you a, a thorough understanding of what Latin and PGD is about. I just want to give you an understanding of what this kind of stuff can be used for and, and, and what kind of research we might do on something like this. But still to give you an idea of what the workflow of something like this would be, uh, here's the, the algorithm. So we're starting with some initial low rank approximation of our displacement. Yeah? So we're interested in our displacement field. But again, we have modes in displacement modes in space, and we have separated out the time modes. Yeah? So that's precisely what PGD is about. So this is the PGD part. And somehow we start with maybe one mode that could simply be our linear elasticity computation, or we made already half a couple of modes from previous analysis. So that's what we're going to start with right here. Now, suppose that we have now these modes, and for our new iteration or, or for a new uh, cycle in our load path, um, we find that these modes do not satisfy our equations, right? Maybe the new load cycle is, is much higher in amplitude, so certainly our displacement doesn't fit that. Or maybe we're getting past a certain level of, or of, of, of strain such that, or stress such that we start developing plasticity, or plasticity at certain points. So we find, well, okay, our current estimate of our new load cycle does not satisfy all our, our previous equations. Right? These guys. So then we're going to go into an iterative step that consists of a local stage and a global stage. 
And this by itself uh, is iterated until we have updated our solution u. Yeah, okay, let me first state it like that. And in the local stage, what we're going to do is in every integration point in space and time, given our assumed solution u, we're going to update our strains for our given constitutive laws. And we're going to update our constitutive laws based on our stresses. Yeah, so that might look something like this. In our first assumption, so this would be exact, actually the stress-strain curve um, in a single Gauss point. And then after one iteration, it might, oh, it's going way too fast. Oh, I wanted to stop after one. Okay, so after one iteration of a local stage, we might have updated our stress strain relation in, in the following sense, right? So it's no longer purely linear. We've, we've changed things a little bit. So then, since our constitutive relations have changed and our strains have changed, we're going to have to change our global equations, our uh, static, and, uh, static and kinematic admissibility relations, in such a way that static and, and, and kinematic, um, uh, uh, yeah, such that our solution is statically and kinematically admissible. And that comes down to changing our time modes. Yeah, those are the space modes are expensive to compute. In each iteration, the time modes maybe only involve 20 degrees of freedom, so those are relatively cheap to, uh, to evolve. Yeah? And, and we would do this by uh, doing sort of an increment. So we're going to change, we're going to add a delta lambda to, to, our, to our previous lambdas. Yeah? So we're going to change the time modes in such a way that, again, our solution u, also in an increment sense, uh, is again satisfying um, uh, static and... Am I saying this right? Uh, static, and, yeah, static and kinematic uh, emiss uh, emissibility. So after we've done that, we go to the second iteration. We again go through a local phase. Uh, damn it. We go through a local phase. We find that our stress strain changes again a little bit, uh, which means that we have to update our displacement field so that all the equations are satisfied. Then we go to a new uh, local stage and we iterate this until. Uh, until uh, our increments don't change anything anymore. So at that point we might still not be happy with the solution that we have obtained because the residual is still too high, right? And that means that we would have to enrich our modes. And that's also what we can typically do in, in really all uh, model reduction techniques, that we can uh, add modes to our computations when we find that our previous modes do not represent our solution behavior sufficiently well. And that's then this last stage, that's this enrichment stage, where we're trying to add now a new space and time mode. Um, uh, and we would use those modes again, uh, go through the same local global stages. Uh, and for every new uh, load cycle, we would now have one more mode that allows us to describe more detailed behavior of our system. Yeah? And maybe in advanced frameworks, you can also throw out modes if you find that they're not, not sufficiently important. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at a, a model problem, uh, example computation here where we had uh, sort of uh, symmetry conditions around here. So this would be a, a block of metal with a hole inside, uh, which we're pulling with a prescribed displacement. Yeah? And as you can see, this displacement, okay, these have relatively constant amplitudes uh, for this model problem, uh, but their frequencies change. And if you do uh, one cycle computation, you might find uh, that we have, uh, well, clearly we have uh, uh, stress and strain concentrations at the notch, right? And in the model formulation, we also have this update of, uh, of damage, right? That's uh, the evolution of states, the damage uh, evolves with time, uh, plastic relations evolve with time. Um, so this is uh, one example that you would get with something like this. Yeah? So uh, apparently, I don't know what this load path was about, that was maybe just an example, uh, but here's the load path corresponding to this damage evolution. Yeah, so we have uh, actually a very strange or a very uh, significant change in amplitude as we're progressing. And this would be now the damage evolution. And you can compute this so fast, or you compute this at all, due to this Latin PGD uh, strategy. Right? So, so um, the whole algorithm that I showed before really involves 
this part of our computation, and that is then repeated for each. Uh, oh, that's not correct. For each cycle. And that's very cheap because we might only have five modes in space, and there are also five modes in time, but we only have to, to tweak these time modes in every iteration. So, um, damage is a bit of a stochastic process, um, also because loading is typically a stochastic uh, um, input. Uh, we might know some average amplitudes, some average frequencies, but then we have a certain spectrum, when we're, for instance, talking about wind loading. So if we're interested in computing our results for a certain structure, then we have to actually run many of these simulations, right? So this is already many cycles, uh, but we would still have to compute many different types of cycles in order to get a, a good feel for what kind of damage might occur in the structure. Yeah, so here we have a whole bunch of different damage realizations for different um, uh, amplitude or frequency uh, variation in the, in the loading, uh, where we now see a uh, certain stagnation of mean and standard deviation of the damage that occurs can occur in, this, in a structure like this. Yeah. So I know this involved. Uh, I don't know it's, if it's written on here. Mm. I think this might have been forty-one different realizations. I think. I think this is the number of degrees of freedom in space. This is the number of load cycles, right? And then we have 41 different realizations of different load cycles. Yeah, so trying to compute this with a high fidelity model, uh, time where you would need, I don't know, maybe 10 different time increments for each single load cycle, where you have 10,000 load cycles, would obviously be very, very expensive. Yeah, so that's where a model load reduction technique shines. Okay, that's kind of the last thing I wanted to show you. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Um, I hope that kind of wraps up nicely everything that we've talked about, like going into something that's a bit more complex, uh, a little deeper, to show what kind of stuff we can uh, do with this. Um, again, this, this concept, uh, concept was a bit uh, different, a bit foreign to, to the things that we've talked about, mostly because we're trying to move away from, tried to move away from this offline online decomposition. Uh, still, though, again, that is kind of the, the, the main thing, what model reduction techniques today uh, are about. Um, then I think I'll, I'll stick to uh, the project sessions on Tuesday, uh, even though this, uh, I think this was the end of the lecture period already. Um, if you do not have time for that, then send me an email, please, so that I know that I, I won't have to wait for someone who is, not, who is not coming. And other than that, I think for the next two or three weeks, we'll still stick with the uh, project session on Tuesday, so that I can help everyone out uh, if they're still interested in and updating the individual project. Yeah? Okay, then I thank you very much for, uh, for, for having listened to me for 13 lectures on, on this topic. I hope you enjoyed the class and uh, I hope to see you in, in any of my future classes. Yeah, thank you very much.